Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Yeah, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome here to Strength to Strength this morning. Again, very much of a, a blessing to be to be with you here. I just want to read, read two verses of scripture and we prepare to start here with this important topic this morning. Um, out of Colossians 3. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above and not on things on the earth. So this morning, um, we get up early and to enter into, yeah, this work right here. Um, I hope you've done it because you're raised with Christ. And also uh, the reality of Christ, of our mediator, um, of, our, of this perfect high priest, uh, seated at God's right hand is an incredible thought. Um, this week, I've had quite, I've had two engaging conversations with a Muslim um, on who Jesus is, and that we believe He is the Son of God, and that we believe He's at God's right hand, and and that we believe Jesus is God. We believe in the Trinity, and and some of these these thoughts that are so scandalous to the Muslim mind. But what an incredible reality! What an incredible reality, knowing that Christ is seated at God's right hand. So let's set our mind on things above. And um, and I trust that's why you're here this morning. And my prayer is, is that as we go throughout the day, that this our time together this morning would, would be a, a catalyst for that, of keeping our minds set on things that are above. So again, welcome here to Strength to Strength. It's a blessing to have you here. I'm, I'm excited to have our brother Paul Garber on from New York. Um, I, I think he's in New York for, for a couple more months and moving to Boston, Massachusetts, as I understand. But Paul, really good to have you here. Um, Paul and I have known each other for a couple of years now and have interacted um, in different ways uh, as they were on a journey uh, trying to understand the kingdom of God. And Paul has quite a story from old order Amish background to more into the leaving that into the Protestant world and serving in Brazil, meeting his wife there, and then back to Pennsylvania and back into a, a kingdom church. So, um, Paul, I'm, 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 it's amazing to see how God has worked in your life and uh, looking forward to hearing you share this morning on something that you you care deeply uh, about. Uh, I, I met up with uh, Paul and I had a Zoom call earlier this week just to connect and talk about this this talk. And he told me he's read, I think you said, reread five books in preparation for this call. So um, that's that's some dedication right there. Um, but I know it's something you care deeply about, and you see it as very formative to your journey in understanding Jesus and his kingdom. And so looking forward to this. Uh, Paul's topic this morning is reading Paul through first century eyes, I believe. Um, kind of, I'll talk, this will talk in my head, but... Um, that idea, and that's a big lift. And so let's um, let's pray for our brother here as we get started. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, uh, for this opportunity this morning that we can come together as a community of Christ. Father, we we deeply want to set our mind on things above. So quickly, our minds go on things below, um, and even our minds so quickly go into go follow want to follow our flesh and want to be influenced by the world and. Oh, it's evil. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, that you have mercy on us, that you will pour out your spirit, that you give us the grace that we need to um, be faithful to you, to truly be risen with you. And I pray that you'll bless our brother Paul as he brings this message. Give him a clear mind, give him the, the, the ability to speak and to share and, and for you to work through him, Lord. May he be a toll in your hands for this very important talk. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, all yours, brother, and um, we'll of course, of course, open it up for some questions at the end. So we we'll look forward to that. Lessons. Okay, thank you, thank you, brother Bryant. Okay, well, uh, good morning, everyone. It's good to, to have you all uh, here with us, and uh, I, I know it's an early morning, and sometimes uh, 
I can be uh, a little not quite awake yet at this time, but I, I'm, I'm glad for all who, who joined us. So, uh, yeah, this morning my talk is about uh, how to read the Apostle Paul's letters through first century eyes. And uh, I want to help us to rid our minds of modern thinking when approaching Paul's letters and step back into the first century context and read from their vantage point. My proposal is actually really simple. Um, read Paul's words for what he actually says and not what we can make him say to address our concerns. Uh, for many today, this is very hard to do. I don't have any uh, special insight into what was going through Paul's mind uh, other than what he actually wrote and the place and context uh, in history in which he was writing. So this morning, I want to start with a couple of extreme examples of misunderstanding Paul's writings that have led to disastrous conclusions. About 10 years ago, uh, I was a part of a church that split over the question of whether Paul was a true apostle of Christ or an imposter. One man firmly believed that Paul was an imposter and a heretic. Since Jesus taught self-denial, cross-bearing, and um, obedience as the way of salvation with no mention of grace, and Paul taught salvation by grace alone through faith alone, that clearly shows that that Paul and Jesus' message uh, contradict each other and are ir irreconcilable. The answer for this individual was to reject Paul as a false teacher and just accept the pure words of Jesus as recorded in Matthew, Mark, and John. So his New Testament looks very different from the one that we accept. This particular church split was uh, incredibly disastrous and played a part in some very uh, some people very dear to us to walk away from the faith altogether. Um, now we also have the opposite side of this coin. And I know quite a number of people in this camp, including quite a few former Anabaptists, and it's called hyper dispensationalism. Uh, classic dispensationalism is a very dangerous error uh, and should be avoided at all costs. But hyper dispensationalism takes the error to a whole new level, perhaps more consistently than the classic and more moderate kind. Their position is also that Paul's message and Jesus' message contradict one another. And thus, Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles, so his message for grace is for us in the church age. And Jesus' message of works must be for the future millennial reign of Christ. And they call, uh, which they call the kingdom age. Their cutting and dicing of scripture is based partly on 2 Timothy 2.15 from the King James Bible. Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. The key phrase for them is rightly dividing. And so they cut and divide the New Testament into different dispensations. Paul's letters are for us, the Gentile church, quote unquote, uh, a completely made up category, by the way, uh, there's no such thing as the Gentile church. Uh, while the Gospels, James and Hebrews are for Israel in the millennium. I'm not going to take the time this morning to exegete Second Timothy 2, but the reason I bring this up. Excuse me, <clears throat> but the reason uh, reason I bring up these two extreme viewpoints is to highlight the importance of reading Paul in context, both in Paul's historical context, as well as the meaning and usage of words that Paul used himself. What's interesting is in that both of the examples that I gave, their reading of Paul is basically the same. Paul preached grace and Jesus preached works. Now, I brought up two extreme viewpoints where one side rejects Paul and his teachings and the other side rejects the teachings of Jesus as relevant for today. But I don't want anyone to think that if they don't fall into any of these two extremes, that their understanding must be correct. The reason these two viewpoints were even able to arise is because of some very foundational misunderstandings of Paul uh, and of Jesus. So even if you don't fall into any of these extreme errors, the question is, do you hold to a moderate misunderstanding of Paul that would naturally lead to these extremes 
if taken to their logical conclusions. Some people may wonder why I'm so concerned uh, with these finer points of theology and splitting hairs over things that don't really matter all that much. Um, well, I would just beg to differ that the interpretation of God's word doesn't matter. Everything that we believe has consequences and lead down a certain path. It may not be obvious to you right now, but in the long run, your theology charts a course for your life and for many others. The follower of Jesus should have a sensitive conscience and should care deeply about truth, whether or not our short-sighted minds can see the consequences. Having said that, there are places where the meaning of scripture on a given subject isn't totally clear. In such cases, Christians should leave room for differences of opinion, especially if the church throughout history has held to different views. However, in most cases, especially in the areas of scripture that requires our obedience, we need to take a firm stand. Let me read a quote from uh, uh, Finney Kuravilla uh, on interpreting scripture. The greatest battle raging today within the church is how to understand and interpret the scriptures. This battle affects practically everything, one's view of God, the gospel, obedience, and the church. It has even been said that the history of the church is the history of biblical interpretation. The great temptations of scripture, Adam and Eve's temptation by the serpent in the garden, and Jesus' temptation by Satan in the wilderness, were centered on interpretations of God's word. Emblematic of humanity's constant struggle, these temptations have morphed in character, but not in goal. The goal is to kill and destroy humanity by warping God's word. The stakes can hardly be overstated, end quote. Before we go any farther, uh, we must be very clear that Paul's teachings are authoritative and binding for all who want to be disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me read uh, two quotes from uh, uh, two very early Christian writers. Uh, the first one is from Ignatius, and he says, I do not, as Peter and Paul, issue commandments unto you. They were apostles. And the second one is from Polycarp. For neither I nor any other such one can come up to the wisdom of the blessed and glorified Paul. As we see, the early church held the apostle Paul in very high regard as we should today. And they use very lofty language when talking about him. So here we stand in the year, uh, in the year of our Lord, 2023, uh, 2000 years after Paul penned his letters to the various congregations in the Greek and Latin speaking world. And whether we know it or not, we are heirs of years and centuries and even millennia of accumulated traditions penal substitutionary atonement, imputed righteousness, and individualistic thinking. Our understanding of certain words and phrases are also inherited. For us here in the West, we are especially influenced by the Protestant Reformation, Martin Luther, John Calvin, etc. So words like grace, faith, righteousness, justice, law, and salvation often have fixed meanings in our minds. Within the last 30 or 40 years, there has been some scholarly opposition to some of these long-held Protestant uh, presuppositions that I just mentioned. Uh, these viewpoints are often labeled the new perspectives on Paul uh, and are based on, on sound historical scholarship of first century Judaism and the context of Paul's letters. Uh, one of the more well-known of these scholars is N.T. Wright, uh, at least the one I'm most familiar with. Um, Let's talk about a new viewpoint versus an old viewpoint or a new movement versus an old movement. Uh, if the movement or the viewpoint is an attempt to shed all new innovations and get back to the original, it's more like a revival of the old movement. So when we talk about the new perspectives on Paul, we're not talking about a new innovation, but a rediscovery of the old. But since Protestant scholarship has misunderstood Paul for so long, and now some well-known and respected scholars, Protestant scholars, are starting to understand and correct some of these misunderstandings, this scholarship on Paul is being labeled the new perspectives. 
These new perspectives on Paul are in fact not new at all among kingdom Christians. What is new is that prominent Protestant scholarship is finally catching up to what kingdom Christians have believed all along, especially in regards to Paul's letters. During the early years of the Anabaptist movement, the established Roman church has been around for over a thousand years. One could have charged the Anabaptists of starting a new movement and teaching new doctrines. But was it really new? Of course not. They were simply trying to be faithful and accurate in their obedience to the original teachings of Jesus without all these mountains of accumulated doctrinal innovations and traditions. What about us today? Will we follow in the same vision of faithfulness to the pure message of Jesus as recorded by the apostles or be influenced by the doctrinal innovations of the Protestant reformers and their children? We have 500 years of Protestant teaching and tradition to overcome. I would argue that this influence is far more harmful and dangerous than what the early Anabaptists faced with the Roman church, since many Protestants were and are gifted Bible teachers. And with the motto, sola scriptura, we are being led to believe that we are just being taught the Bible. I'm very much opposed to any new perspectives. Uh, that people come up with. Dispensationalism by John Del Nelson Darby, imputed righteousness by Martin Luther, and original sin and just war by Augustine. These are the real new perspectives that we should re reject. So with all that said, I have six points that I would like to go through to help us in understanding Paul. Number one, Paul's place in the biblical storyline. One of the first questions we should ask when reading Paul's letters is, where does Paul fit into the larger story? Uh, even when my 10-year-old daughter picks up a book and reads it, she doesn't open up the book and start reading uh, in the middle, unless she already knows the context and the previous parts of the story where she, uh, that leads up to where she wants to read. Um. Some books, like the Quran, uh, do not have a storyline from beginning to end, uh, but the Bible most definitely does. Um, it's not a grab bag of verses. It has a storyline. <clears throat> beginning with creation and ending with new creation. The Bible is not a grab bag of verses. You can't just reach in there and pull out a verse to suit your fancy. You have to read with an understanding of its order. When we start reading in Romans and Ephesians, we need to read in the context of the inaugurated kingdom of God with Jesus as the supreme ruler, his teachings and commandments as the non-negotiable constitution of the land. Of course, the commandments that Paul gives us are um, also to be seen as coming from Jesus and are non-negotiable. Uh, Finney Corvilla uh, puts it very well. Uh, let me read another quote from him. The early Anabaptists viewed Paul's letters as an infallible exposition of Jesus' words and deeds, but they preferred to begin at the gospel accounts themselves. This manner of reading more appropriately uses canonical and covenantal structure as a her hermeneutical lens. Anabaptists begin at the beginning of the covenant, preamble, history, and stipulations, rather than the later prosecution of God's covenant lawsuit found in the epistles, end quote. In other words, uh, Paul's letters build upon the foundation of the life, teachings, example, death, resurrection, ascension, and enthronement of Jesus. Okay, number two. Paul preached the kingdom of God that Jesus preached. Jesus' central message was the kingdom of God. Paul's message was absolutely the same as Jesus. Of course, Paul spoke a lot about grace, which is God's power enabling us to live in his kingdom. One of the most beautiful statements about the gospel of the kingdom is found in Romans chapter 1, verses 1 to 6. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, 
which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son, who was descended from David, according to the flesh, and was declared to be the son of God in power, according to the spirit of holiness, by his resurrection from the dead. Jesus Christ, our Lord, through, who, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Here he uses uh, Jesus' royal title three times. Christ Jesus, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ. He used it three times. This passage is so jam-packed with meaning. Uh, Jesus, the anointed king of Israel, the fulfillment of the prophetic scriptures, the hope of Israel flowing from Israel to the whole world to bring about the obedience of faith. Uh, a very rich passage indeed. In Luke's recording of Paul's traveling and preaching in the book of Acts, we read that Paul preached the kingdom of God. In Acts 20, verses 24 and 25, But I do not account my life of any value nor as precious to myself, if only I may finish my course and the ministry that I have received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that none of you among whom I have gone about proclaiming the kingdom, will see my face again. The context here is Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders as he's about to leave for Jerusalem. Here we see that the gospel of the grace of God and the kingdom are one and the same. In Acts 28, when Paul arrives in Rome, he calls the local Jewish leaders together and says this to them. For this reason, therefore, I have asked to see you, and speak with you, since it is because of the hope of Israel that I am wearing this chain. What is the hope of Israel? The Messiah and his kingdom, the eternal kingdom of God. Verse 23 says, when they had appointed a day for him, they came to him at his lodging in greater numbers. From morning till evening, he expounded to them, testifying to the kingdom of God and trying to convince them about Jesus, both from, both from the law of Moses and from the prophets. This is the kingdom foretold in the law and the prophets, the eternal kingdom without end, the throne of David. Uh, going on down to verse, uh, verses 30 and 31, he lived there two whole years at his own expense and welcomed all who came to him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Jesus preached the kingdom of God. And as we see, Paul preached the kingdom that Jesus inaugurated, the hope of Israel. The difference between Jesus and Paul uh, is mainly that Jesus spoke about the kingdom before his enthronement and coronation. Paul comes along later and explains what these significant events mean, practically and prophetically. <clears throat> Okay, number three, the Jew and Gentile controversy, under, understanding uh, that this was uh, understanding the Jew and Gentile controversy. This context is especially important whenever Paul is addressing the works of the law versus grace and faith. One thing is obvious when reading Acts or the letters of Paul, and that is that the Jew and Gentile controversy was front and center in these writings. It's important to understand that the works of the law that Paul talks about so often are not just works of any law, but the Mosaic law, and especially circumcision. Acts 15, 5. Uh, but some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and order them to keep the law of Moses. So it was circum circumcision and the law of Moses. This is what Paul says about such people. Philippians 3, 2 and 3. Look out for dogs. Look out for evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. For we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Circumcision was commanded by God to Abraham as an everlasting covenant. It was the sign of God's land promise to Abraham in Genesis 17. I would argue that in the eyes of most Jews, 
circumcision was the single most important commandment. It's what defined them as children of Abraham and heirs to the land that God promised to Abraham. But what does Paul say? He says, look out for dogs and evildoers. Wait a minute, Paul. Dogs are the uncircumcised Gentiles. But then he goes on to say, look out for those who mutilate the flesh. Paul couldn't have struck at a more vital organ. This was the sacred everlasting covenant of circumcision. It's what defined them as Jews and heirs to the land. If someone wanted to join Israel and become part of God's covenant people, the first thing to do was for the man to get circumcised. But what does Paul say? He says, we are the circumcision who worship by the spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. In other words, we who are followers of Jesus, the circumcised of heart, are the real successors of Abraham and heirs to the land promise. The Jew and Gentile circumcised and uncircumcised controversy was a very big issue for Paul. The Jews and Judaizers didn't mind Gentiles joining Israel. Uh, that wasn't the issue. Jesus even said that the Pharisees crossed land and sea to make proselytes. But they had to get circumcised and keep the law in order to be part of Israel and its promises. Paul turned all those ideas inside out and upside down. Number four, a corporate focus rather than an individual focus. Well, God certainly cares about each of us individually and saves us individually. Many passages in Paul's letters have a corporate focus, uh, particularly passages about election and salvation. Uh, let's go to the Calvinist's favorite chapter in the Bible, Romans 9. Verses, uh, starting reading in verse 1. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears me witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen according to the flesh. They are Israelites. To them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ, who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. Now, just stopping there for a moment, who is Paul talking about? This is the fleshly nation of Israel, a corporate group of people. He's not talking about individual people. He's talking about a corporate group of people, the fleshly nation of Israel. From beginning to end, this passage is speaking corporately. Now, uh, reading in verse six, but it is not as though the word of God has failed for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. One could say that God's word has failed because most of fleshly Israel didn't receive their Messiah. So did God's word fail? And Paul says, no, God's word didn't fail. Uh, here, Paul is clearly speaking corporately, and he's contrasting um, fleshly Israel with the Israel of promise. So he's using, in this one verse, he's using Israel in two different senses. Uh, we see this in other places as well, where Paul uses uh, the word Israel in two different senses. So he says, now all who are descended from Israel fleshly Israel, belong to Israel, Israel of promise. So uh, he's using Israel in two different senses here. Verse seven, and not all are children of Abraham because they are his offspring, but through Isaac shall your offspring be named. Now, Isaac was the child of promise, Ishmael, the child of the flesh. Paul uses offspring, uh, offspring here in two different senses as well. Uh, Jesus does the same thing in John chapter 8, verses 37 to 39, and I'll read that real quick. Uh, Jesus says this, I know that you are offspring of Abraham. So here he's using the fleshly offspring of Abraham, right? Yet you seek to kill me because my word finds no place in you. They answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. 
Both Paul and Jesus make a clear distinction between the true children of Abraham, to whom belong the promises, and the children of the flesh. <clears throat> okay, verse 8. This means that it is not the children of the flesh who are the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as offspring. Um, yeah, so I, I mentioned before the two different ways in which children and offspring are used. They're, they're used two different ways. The, the real children of the promise are, are not necessarily the same as the, as the fleshly. Um, for this is what the promise said, verse 9. Uh, about this time, I will return. next year, I will return and Sarah shall have a son. And not only so, but also Rebecca, when had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac. Though, though they were not yet born and had done neither good nor bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob I love, but Esau I hated. Now, now, now uh, before it said the Ishmael and Isaac, now it's speaking of Jacob and Esau. And again, he uses the two in the same way. Uh, remember that this passage is still speaking corporately. It's not about Jacob as a person or Esau as a person, but corporate entities uh, or systems that they represent. Fleshly Israel versus the Israel of promise. Esau, the firstborn, is fleshly Israel, and Jacob, the younger, is the Israel of promise. Um, continuing on, verse 14 here. What shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means, for he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Now here, continue with the same theme. Uh, Pharaoh represents fleshly, unbelieving Israel. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills and he hardens whomever he wills. Again, corporate entities. A fleshly Israel was hardened as a corporate entity, but not every individual. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault and who can resist his will? But who are you, O man, to answer back to God? Will, will what is molded say to its molder, why have you made me like this? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? So in keeping with Paul's theme from the start, he's still talking about corporate entities. We, we, we shouldn't forget this as we read down through this. Fleshly Israel was the vessel prepared for destruction, and the Israel of promise was prepared for glory, not individual people. What if God desiring, verse 22, what if God desiring to show his wrath and to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared for glory, even us whom he called not from the Jews only, but also from the Gentiles. So again, a corporate entity of Jews and Gentiles brought together in Christ, the Israel of promise. Imagine if this chapter is not speaking corporately, but individually. It would contradict everything else that the Bible teaches about free will and our responsibility. And the Calvinists would be right that God created and prepared individual people for destruction and damnation. But of course, as we can see, just from, just from reading the actual text, it's speaking corporately from the very beginning. This chapter is only one example of Paul speaking corporately, not individually. Uh, there are many more places like this, especially in Galatians. Uh, let me read a, just a couple of verses from Galatians 3, verses 22 to 24. But the scripture imprisoned everything under sin, so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith should be revealed. So then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. The law was our guardian until Christ came, the one, the one to whom, upon whom our faith is to be placed. 
Paul is speaking about a specific law here that came into existence 430 years after Abraham. That's back in verse 17, the Mosaic law. The law was our guardian until Christ came. Clearly, the hour in this passage is speaking about a collective group of people. God's covenant people, the Israel of promise, into which the Galatian Christians were grafted. Okay, that was uh, corporate focus rather than individual focus when we read. Um, number five here, a proper understanding of words like grace and faith. I could have added many more words to this list of misunderstood words, but for the sake of time, I want to only focus on these two. Let's take these words one at a time, grace. Paul himself defines this word for us. So let's take Paul's own definition and apply it to other places where Paul uses the word. Titus 2, 11 to 15, for the grace of God has appeared. Let's stop right there. Okay, Paul, what does the grace of God do? Continuing, continuing on, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession, who are zealous of good works. Declare these things, exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no one disregard you. This is what Paul says that grace does. Teaching us to live godly, obedient lives. You know, um, if someone lives disobediently and says, Oh, that's not a salvation issue. I'm saved by grace. I can assure you from the teachings of the Apostle Paul that such a person is not saved by anything, much less by grace. They are simply using grace as a cover for their disobedience and a license for their sin. Strong's Dictionary defines grace this way, charis, the Greek word charis. Uh, it says, especially the divine influence upon the heart and its reflection in the life. This definition agrees with Paul's definition in Titus 2. Grace is not a concept or a favorable feeling. It's an actual power that teaches and changes us from the heart outward. Now let's look at some other passages about grace. Um, this one is from uh, John 1.17. This is what John says about Jesus. He says, for the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Um, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Now let's take Paul's definition of grace and apply it here. God's powerful, life-changing, and transforming work comes through Jesus Christ. It, it's really simple. It's not complicated. Okay, uh, I want to read Romans 8, 1 to 4. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the spirit of life, uh, I would say this is grace here. Paul doesn't use the word grace in this passage, but his uh, concept of grace is. Uh, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. For what God has done, again, I would add through grace, what the law weakened by the flesh could not do by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us again through grace who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. See, uh, the word grace isn't used in this passage, but Paul's theology of grace certainly is. Uh, Ephesians 2, 1 to 10, a very famous uh, passage here about uh, faith by grace through faith. Um, let's read, uh, yeah, verse 1. Uh, and you were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind. And we're by nature children of wrath, like the rest of mankind. Okay, let's stop right there. What is Paul describing here? He's describing a 
sinful and disobedient life. Okay, up to this point, uh, verses 1 to 3, a sinful and disobedient life. Now, let's read verse 4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Okay, what did grace do in this passage? Changed, by grace you have been saved, changed from being what Paul described in verses 1 through 3, sinful and disobedient, to being holy and obedient, right? Grace actually did something. It's powerful and it's working and it does something. Um, let's read down uh, verse six uh, and onward. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Um, God's active, powerful grace, not the Mosaic law and not your own bootstraps, but it's God's active, powerful grace that does this. Um, verse, verse 10, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. See, when we understand the biblical definition of grace, these passages and others make beautiful sense. Grace is an active, uh, powerful force enabling us to overcome uh, sin, uh, a sinful life and live obediently. Um, I'd like to read a short quote by Charlton Swayze on, on what uh, grace does, salvation uh, uh, by grace. Salvation's purpose is to transform us into what we have been created to be and enable us to live out our vocation in this present world as renewed humanity in Jesus. The goal is not for you to go to heaven when you die. Rather, it is for heaven to be manifest in you to this world. End quote. This is a truly powerful statement about salvation by grace. What grace does. There are many other passages that we could look at about grace, but we won't for the sake of time. Let's, let me just say one thing about what grace is not. Grace is not God overlooking our sins and false teachings. And grace is not God's favor in our sins, but rather God's favor to overcome our sins. Um, I was once told that I need to show more grace and be more gracious. Uh, by that, they meant to coddle someone in their sins. Uh, I'm sorry. I just, that's just not what grace even means. And I don't accept that definition. I'm not willing to change the meaning of words to fit someone's ideology, even though it seems like the popular thing to do these days. Grace does not coddle people in their sins and false teachings. Grace teaches and empowers us to overcome. You know, we lament the lukewarmness and apathy in many churches today. Could it be that it is due to a castrated version of grace as simply unmerited favor? Well, uh, well grace is, is unmerited. Uh, it is not unconditional or inactive. And while it is also favor, it is empowering, not overlooking. Is it any wonder that many churches are impotent and powerless? As C.S. Lewis would say, we castrate and bid the geldings be fruitful. <clears throat> All right, uh, let's look at the word faith. Paul repeatedly tells us that our faith is what God counts as righteous. If we are concerned with our standing before God, then we should understand this word. Romans 4, 1 to 5. What shall we say that was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, um, works of the law, we're told that specifically in Galatians, uh, the Mosaic law. Uh, if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works... His wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. 
And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Going down to uh, verse nine. Uh, is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. Going down to verse 20. No unbelief made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. So many times in this passage, we, we, we see that Abraham's faith, God considered righteous. The Greek word pistis is often translated faith. And then the verb form, pistuo, is often translated as believe. Well, I'm not a Greek scholar. I can quote Greek scholars. And here's two of them. Matthew Bates says this. I have made the claim that pistis, which has traditionally been translated as faith in Paul's letters, is better understood as allegiance when speaking of how the gospel of Jesus unleashes God's power for salvation. And this translation makes perfect sense of the way that Paul uses the word. According to Paul, the call of the gospel is a royal call into Christ Jesus' messianic kingdom. So pistis is allegiance to the king, and God considers that to be righteous. In Abraham's case, allegiance to God. In our case, allegiance to God through his son. This is what Finney Curavilla writes about pistis. Another important example is the word faith or believe. Imagine that a friend asks you, do you believe in God? Most people would take such a question as, do you believe that God exists? But consider how differently we understand each of the following three questions. Number one, do you believe that God exists? Number two, do you have faith in God? And number three, are you faithful to God. In the Greek of the New Testament, all three senses are captured by the word translated as faith. The word faith is a translation of the Greek word pistis. The Septuagint, New Testament, and the first century Greek literature often uses the word pistis and its cognates in the sense of being faithful, loyal, and reliable. The first definition of pistis from a prominent Greek lexicon is the state of being someone in whom confidence can be placed faithfulness, reliability, fidelity, and commitment. A little farther down, he says, just as in English, the adjective form of the word provides valuable insight to what the cognate noun means. For example, the relationship of strong to strength. Faithful captures an important dimension of what the word faith means. The meaning of the word faith cannot be restricted to just one sense. Its semantic range is broad and different contexts will highlight different senses. But we must be careful not to be overpowered by Protestant sensibilities where faith is nearly always contrasted to works. The New Testament sometimes contrasts faith to disobedience. For example, John 3:36, Hebrews 3:18 and 19 and 1 Peter 2:7. By setting up faith as a contrast to faithful obedience, the propaganda of disobedience gains a major victory. <clears throat> so here again, um, uh, uh, Curvilla says that uh, uh, faith, uh, the word, uh, the word pistis has, you know, the meaning of faithful, uh, reliability, fidelity, commitment, and so on. So speaking of the propaganda of disobedience, uh, here's what John MacArthur says when writing about the assurance of salvation. If the preservation of salvation depends on what believers themselves do or do not do, their salvation is only as secure as their faithfulness, which provides no security at all. According to that view, believers must protect by their own human power what Christ get, began by his divine power. Um, you know, there are few people better at twisting God's word than MacArthur. According to him, you can have faith 
but not be faithful. <laughs> That's like saying you can have strength, but not be strong, right? Or have beauty, but not be beautiful. Having strength and being strong are two different ways of saying the same thing, like having faith and being faithful. Another quote from MacArthur, on the basis of our faith in him, Jesus Christ ushers us into the grace in which we stand. Although faith is necessary for salvation, it is God's grace, not the believer's faith, that has the power to save and keep him or her saved. We are not saved by divine grace, then preserved by human effort. End quote. Notice how MacArthur completely misunderstands both grace and faith. In other words, according to MacArthur, being faithful to Jesus is being preserved by human effort and protecting by our own power. It seems to me that he doesn't believe in grace at all and directly contradicts what Paul says, uh, contradicts Paul that says that Abraham's faith is what God considered righteous. Another pusher of the propaganda of disobedience is John Piper. Um, He's he's uh, he's uh, commenting on Second Corinthians five twenty one, which says, "For our sake he was made uh, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God." This passage is pretty straightforward. Paul says that we might become the righteousness of God. That's grace empowering us to become something. But Piper, in commenting on this passage, says the exact opposite. If Christ being made sin for us implies the imputation of our sin to Christ, then it is not arbitrary or unnatural to construe the parallel. So just jumping in here, notice how he says it's not arbitrary and unnatural. And then he proceeds to insert something arbitrary and unnatural like imputation. Uh, And then continuing on our our becoming the righteousness of God in him as the imputation of Christ of God's righteousness to us. We become God's righteousness the way Christ was made our sin. He did not become morally sinful in the imputation, and we do not become morally righteous in the imputation. He, has, he was counted as having our sin, and we are counted as having God's righteousness. Um, this is the reality of imputation, and the righteousness imputed is not our faith, but an external divine righteousness. I affirm again that in the New Testament, justification does involve a positive imputation of divine righteousness to believers. And righteousness does not consist of faith, but it is received by faith. Paul does teach that God imputes to believers an external divine righteousness that is ours as a gift of grace. This conclusion I have tried to show is the fruit of exegesis, not the imposition onto the Bible of foreign ideas. End quote. Notice how he shoehorns foreign ideas into the Bible, like imputation, and then says, this is not the imposition onto the Bible of foreign ideas. Of course, that's exactly what it is. These uh, teachings by Piper and MacArthur make me think of a quote by N.T. Wright. Once you can make scripture stand on its hind legs and dance a jig, it becomes a tame pet rather than the roaring lion. It is no longer authoritative in any strict sense. That is, it may be cited as though proof of some point or other, but it is not leading the way, energizing the church with the fresh breath of God himself. I have a quick illustration here that I'd like to show you that, uh, that, uh, that what imputed righteousness looks like. Okay. Actually, Martin Luther is famous for this manure illustration. He says our righteousness is like a snow covered dung pile. Here is a pile of horse manure from my neighbor. And this is what, this is what righteousness looks like according to uh, uh, imputed righteousness. God covers it there. Now you don't see it anymore. Now God only sees the righteousness of Christ covering over this pile of manure. It stays a pile of manure. In fact, the uh, Westminster confession says that we sin every day in thought, word, and deed. And so, uh, and, and, and also, um, Piper says that we do not become morally righteous in the, in the imputation. They would say that now that it's covered, it should get better. It, it should uh, naturally get better. But 
uh, when God looks at you, he doesn't see uh, who you are. He doesn't see your actions. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what you do because you're covered with the righteousness of Christ. Um, <clears throat> this is this is uh, this manure pile never actually changes. And it doesn't matter that it changes because it's covered with the righteousness of Christ. So, yeah, God's uh, to repeat myself. God only sees the righteousness of Christ. That's that's what what this doctrine of imputed righteousness looks like. It's simply covering over something and it doesn't uh, it's not God's active, powerful grace changing us. Now, here's a more accurate illustration of what grace does and what salvation looks like. This manure gets composted and the nutrients uh, get transformed. The manure gets transformed into something beautiful and useful. And, 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 uh, and uh, th these, these plants get absorb the manure and get transformed by grace, we could say. And this is what God's grace actually does. Th that's a more of an ac accurate picture of grace and salvation. <clears throat> it transforms uh, us uh, who are uh, smelly and dirty into something beautiful and useful. That's what true righteousness looks like. Uh, Philip Hess um, describes righteousness uh, this way. Righteousness or the lack thereof is shown by our actions. We cannot really know if someone is righteous until we have observed them react to positive and negative situations enough to see that what is coming out in their responses. However, God knows the heart. He knows if a person has the kind of heart disposition that will lead to righteousness. The heart disposition that will lead to righteousness is called faith. God sees faith in the heart. He does not need to wait until the person demonstrates it in righteous acts to declare that the person is righteous. God knows what will be the result. If Abraham believed God, God looked into his heart and saw trust in God there. God counts that kind of heart attitude as righteous, even if no righteous works have yet happened. So Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, Romans 4, 3. God knew that Abraham's faith was the kind that would lead to righteousness. So he declares Abraham to be righteous before Abraham demonstrated it in action. Because the heart represents the core of your personality, what is in your heart is who you truly are. If you are brain damaged, so you cannot move, you cannot speak, cannot perform any righteous acts, cannot do anything, but you have a heart full of faith and love for Jesus. You are righteous. Righteousness may be seen in external action, actions, but righteousness itself is more than actions. End quote. Let's take the, uh, the thief on the cross, for example. He had true faith uh, at his encounter with Jesus on the cross. Uh, but afterwards, he didn't have the opportunity to be faithful. Had he been taken down from the cross, he would no doubt have been faithful to Jesus. <clears throat> this is an example of somebody justified by grace through faith. Okay, my sixth point here is read with honesty no matter what the demands might be. I won't, for the sake of time, um, elaborate on this it's pretty uh, pretty um self-explanatory all scripture is better understood when the reader is willing to do what the text requires um <clears throat> so that's my uh my uh point number six so in conclusion um let's uh really quickly go over my six points uh for understanding paul uh, number one paul's place in the bib biblical storyline number two Paul preached the kingdom of God that Jesus preached. Number three, understanding the Jew and Gentile controversy. Number four, having a corporate focus rather than an individual focus. Um, number five, a proper understanding of words like grace and faith. And number six, read with honesty no matter what the demands might be. In closing, let me read uh, uh, one quote from N.T. Wright here. Paul believed that it was his vocation, a very Jewish vocation, rooted in Israel's scriptures, 
to announce that the promises and purposes of Israel's God had been fulfilled, overcoming the dark powers of evil and thus enabling idol worshiping, sexually immoral and ritually impure Gentiles to come into the transformative obedience of faith. Thus, by fulfilling Israel's scriptures, the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy, while Jews like Paul himself would celebrate the world changing achievements of Jesus, of, of Israel's true Messiah. And with that, uh, Brother Brian, I'll turn it back to you. Thank you, Brother. Um, as happens many times on Saturday morning, um, like the Emmaus Road experience, uh, my heart burns within me. Thank you, Paul, for taking us on this, on this journey and really going to the root. Um, of of the, some some of the things that we're grappling with uh, in our in our world and in our churches today, uh, there's a quote that goes like this, and it's one of my favorite quotes. While a thousand men are slashing at the leaves of evil, there's one that's going to the root, and and the kingdom message goes to the root. You know, it's never power over, it's never coercion. It's always come and join, <clears throat> come and join into the work of the kingdom, you know, repent, be baptized, um, come follow Jesus. And, you know, understanding then scripture through that Christocentric lens that you're that you were laying out here, um, on point number one, Paul's place in the biblical storyline, really. Um so yeah, thank you, um, thank you for these thoughts, and also just the uh, well, I love your illustration there. Uh, um, wow, may we be plants, you know? It's so yes. Yeah, so first of all, it, it, we want to be careful. I mean, we want to. Um, I want to be um, humble in my polemic uh, on this particular subject as myself. How am I? Am I becoming that beautiful plant or am I just, you know, just just wallowing along in the mire and, uh, and not experiencing that life in Christ? So I, I, I deeply want to be that beautiful plant to get that to allow Christ in me to change me and to, as that one quote said, for heaven to be manifest in me to the world. And is, isn't that what it's about? It's about bringing heaven to earth. Um, it's not about it's not about getting saved so we can go to heaven. Um, that's not the emphasis of the New Testament, of the kingdom message. It's about bringing heaven to earth right now. And what a powerful um, vision statement. What a, what a, what a powerful uh, call. So I'm just going to open it up here. Um, is there any questions for Paul? A any comments? Any pushback? Well, I want to say a hearty amen to this classic presentation. Uh, a word that we could discuss would be the word election. Uh, those uh, That other gospel says God is electing people to go to heaven. I understand election to be calling out people to join the kingdom. Uh, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. And so anyone who surrenders to the king becomes part of his kingdom and part of that very favored elect group. That's how I understand election. Maybe you have some comment, Brother Paul. Yeah, thank you for that, Brother John. Um, yeah, I mean, in Romans 9, so each an, uh, individual passage would have to be looked at uh, uh, by itself, you know, see what is the context in which the election, uh, like in, Ro uh, I, I think it's Ephesians 1 that speaks, we are, we are uh, called to be, uh, I forget the, the passage there, but in, elect uh, in, in Christ. Christ, elect in Christ. That's yeah, how you get. But it's not that's how you elect to be in Christ, right? Yes. It is elect in Christ, in 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 Christ, but not to be in Christ. So, if we just take the words for what they say instead of adding concepts, then yeah, then election is in Christ. And also, yeah, of course, like in Romans nine, election is a corporate. God elected uh, the Israel of promise. Um, for salvation. And so, yeah, every, every individual passage would have to be looked at 
uh, to see or what is Paul talking about here in regards to election. And, and I would say, yeah, it's never electing individual people to go to heaven while other individual people to go to hell. <laughs> the phrase elect in Christ to me means that every person who's in Christ becomes one of the elect. Yeah, thank you, uh, John. And um, yeah, Paul, back to this, this corporate or strong group versus a weak group understanding, I, I think, is also so, and you had one of those points, corporate versus individual. Um, it's, it's so key to understanding who we are and our, our work in the world as, as not, it's, you know, as not just such an individual focus, but it's, it's really about entering into this great work, this community, uh, this kingdom that God has established here on earth and participating in that work that Christ has already started. Just the ability to be able to participate and to, you know, to bring heaven to earth, uh, you know, to work out that reconciliation as world. What an, what an incredible, incredible privilege. And I think, you know, people like MacArthur and those um, who, who want to, um, you know, who are so Calvinistic and, and, and so have such an impoverished, it's an incredibly impoverished gospel um, you know, they're, they're just, they're so fearful of works and so fearful of these things, but, um, but it really, it, it just destroys it, the work of the kingdom. It cuts it off at the, the knees of the torso, like you can't advance as, as, as some of the points that you made, that you made so clearly there. Um, yeah. Is there any more, any, any more thoughts, questions here for, uh, for, uh, Paul? So grace, love it. That uh, understanding grace and faith, grace powerful and working, and faith allegiance. Um, you mentioned a book that you read there by Matthew Bates. Is that a book you would recommend here for? I just, would. Uh, yeah. Anybody? Um. I don't see it here right now, but yes, it's called Salvation by Allegiance Alone. Mm -hmm. by Matthew Bates. I would highly sure. recommend that book. Mm -hmm. It, it really goes in depth into the meaning of faith. And he explores the, the word pistis and what it, uh, what it means in the New Testament uh, context. You could add one word yet, Paul, to your uh, scriptures that clearly define grace. It's my favorite verse in the whole Bible. Second Corinthians 9, 8. God is able to make all grace abound unlimited towards you, that you always, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound unto every good work. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a verse that Brother John has shared many times on here, and it's one of my favorites uh, as well. Amen. So, um, Paul, um, as you look at the state of of the, the kingdom churches or Anabaptist churches, what are, how can we resist some of these pretty winsome calls like Piper? You know, Piper, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm not sure if you can, well, okay, I'll stop. But Piper, like he, he's a fairly winsome speaker. Like and we're reading tons of these books. Um, and, and, and they can sound like, you know, they're, they're like a broken clock, you know, right, right. Two times a day. Um, and, and they can, they can sound they're They're wooing people into, into these thoughts and against being, being uh, against bringing heaven to earth and participating against working this out, you know, in, in our lives. Um, what are, what are some ways that we can, we can continue to counter those things? Is there any books that you would recommend? Um, what, what, what are the resources do you have for us and kind of, and, and having a reset, um, the new perspectives on Paul, you know, there's, you know, some of the men you, you quoted there uh, in the Protestant world, Piper MacArthur, you know, I think they, they would call this new perspective heresy. Um, but it's, as you mentioned, it's an old, you know, it goes, it's old. It's, uh, it goes right back to the early church. And it's, it's an accurate, accurate teaching in many ways. So 
yeah, how can we uh, continue to to um, understand these things in a more biblical way? Yeah, you know, I, that is a really big concern of mine, of of being influenced by by very winsome and and uh, influential speakers and authors, um, and people are really drawn to to that kind of. Uh, uh, that kind of maybe a personality. John MacArthur especially is very forceful and very authoritative and uh, he captures people's attention. And uh, I mean, what we need, really what we need is power, uh, p- more powerful speakers, more uh, truth tellers, people that are willing to, uh, uh, to stand up and speak, uh, speak truthfully and, and, and authors, books, uh, I mean, David Berceau's books are absolutely excellent in, in so many of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, countering many of these ideas. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm not sure where else to turn to. I mean, we, 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 we are lacking. Uh, we are lacking good books. And uh, compared to the barrage of books and literature. And, I mean, if I go on Google and I, I type in a, um, a Bible question. One of the first, uh, the first sites that comes up is uh, John Piper's, uh, uh, you know, what is it called? Uh, um, I forget the name of it, but it, it's, it, it's, it's always something that mind. comes up. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Sure. I mean, right here on Strength of Strength is one of uh, one of these uh, you know, ways in which we can. Uh, we can speak loud and clear and we need to. Michael Amen. has a question on the chat. Yeah. Thank you, Patrick. Thanks. Um, uh, let's see. Yeah. When do extra biblical commandments become the same as Jewish law and circumcision? <clears throat> a really easy question there for you, brother. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, extra. Okay. So extra biblical commandments. Well, yeah, that's, that's one thing where not only can they really muddy the water in, uh, in, in understanding the real commandments of Jesus. Oftentimes if we have extra biblical commands that the church requires of us, um, it muddies the water to where we are unsure of what is the commandments of Jesus and a commandment of the church. And so I'm not sure exactly what the question was. How does it? Uh, yeah, well, could you restate the question? Sure, it, it, it came in on the chat here, so um, I'm not quite sure of the context for behind behind that all exactly. So, okay, yeah. Well, I mean, just my thoughts on extra biblical commandments. I guess uh, the the church, uh, I think, should have stands on. Uh, on uh, biblical commands, maybe defining a biblical command, putting it into practice, and so on. Uh, just coming up uh, with something from tradition or something out of the blue uh, that's not even hinted at in Scripture, I think, is uncalled for. So, um, yeah, I do think we, we do have to have um, standards, biblical standards, but not, uh, not something that's just non-biblical. Sure. Thank you. I believe, um, I believe it's a conversation that's been going on in the back pages. There's a lot of people that feel that the the culture too, is too heavy and that they're, they want to shed. This is just my, you know, they want to shed that cultural thing. But the question is, can we have a Christ-like culture without the the Anabaptist culture, or did the Mennonite culture lead to an Anabaptist culture? Was the Anabaptist culture a Mennonite culture, which led to a Christian culture? So people are going haywire with this and trying to break it down. If I remember correctly, Paul says that we should not beat each other up on the way we practice or how a church chooses to practice their faith. So that's just me. I'm sorry about No, I think Thank I you, think Patrick. Patrick's right. Patrick is correct there. Some so I my what gets called extra biblical commandments sometimes is a particular group of brothers application for a scriptural command, if we put it that way. 
So we can say no television in our church. Well, the Bible nowhere says no television. I mean, it's not in the Bible. And so that's an extra biblical command. But we can take a biblical principle and say this is this is how our church would like to apply it. Um, you know, in our church, um, the application, for instance, is is no beard. I mean, it's allowed, but whatever. Other churches say you must have a beard. Okay, that's that's an individual church's application of a principle of scripture, and uh, so I always get a little. I was at Bible school this year, and one of the students says, where do we get all these dumb rules that aren't even in the Bible? And I said, uh, let's just have a question here. What dumb rules do we have that are not based on the Bible? Like what? Um, he shut up really quick. We never did have a good discussion on it. But I think a lot of our, our hang-up is on the way we choose to apply it in our individual groups. Can anybody hear me? I can hear you, Dan. No, Great. I can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, this brings to mind the fact that this past Thursday was the 501st anniversary of the affair of the sausages. Now, there's a good example of an extra biblical commandment. And what did our Anabaptist forefathers do about that? <laughs> they spit into that wind, but good. But oh, now I'm, sorry. I, I, so, I'm sorry I hijacked your thing. Thank you, Dan. I, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, yeah, but, here the sausage um, is uh, Christoph Froschauer and his uh, cohorts were printing Bibles and I think maybe tracts. Anyway, okay. uh, they were publishing things in 1522 uh, in Zurich, I believe. And uh, uh, it fell to Christoph to see that his people got fed some way. And uh, he dragged out some sausages. And it was Lent, and uh, that this is like a, a kind of a major turning point in the um, I'll call it the Anabaptist Revolution. And uh, they they openly defied this idea of um, uh, not eating meat during Lent. And uh, beyond that, they published tracts in defense of this and in, in uh, attacking. Established religion's uh, idea of uh, that you must refrain from meat on uh, during Lent. That's sure. an extra, that's a, that's a serious extra biblical um, commandment that just doesn't have any validity. So yeah, so well, hey, I, I you just ignore it, and sometimes uh, you ignore it at the peril of your life. Right. Well, I think you you um you definitely shared one side uh of, of, of you know a very good you know a good example here of 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 uh people uh rejecting extra biblical standards. Um that's for sure. So yeah, it, this is a huge, huge conversation and it matters too. It really does. As um unfortunately, you know, there's there's things that can that can become idols, you know, in our culture, uh, any church culture really. That we continually need to be holding them, bringing them back to, to God's word and evaluating them in light of, of Jesus and his kingdom and whether these things really are um, what our, our church should be fighting for. We do care about discipleship. We do care that heaven is manifested on earth through us to the world. And so because we care about these things, um, there is, and then because we care, care about community, it's the corporate, we understand deeply a corporate idea, uh, or at least some point, uh, definitely can grow, probably are losing that. But this idea, we're together. As uh, John Dees um, often writes or shows us the chart, you know, the uh, of maybe the Protestant understanding where it's, you know, the people here, God here, and there's many lines going to God, or the kingdom understanding, which is people here. God here and just one line together we come to God. It's that corporate idea um, that's that's very very powerful. I would love to hear you unpack that more in Romans, uh, Paul. Is this is this um, corporate versus individual? I mean, it, it impacts so many different areas in reading Romans. Uh, I'm curious. Have you listened to Brousseau's series on Romans, Paul? 
I, I have uh, the one. Yes, I have. It's it's been a couple months now. So, but yes. And yeah, I, I don't um, I don't think he's really gotten to Romans nine, uh, if I'm not mistaken. I don't think I, okay. I've seen that. Sure. Um, well, you, but yeah, well, I, you, I, I listened to a couple of his talks there. So yes, yeah, definitely some some really 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 solid stuff, Patrick. Well, I'm sorry, Paul. You did a wonderful job. I'm sorry I threw that sucker ball in there, but. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. So, Patrick, I mean, I'm sorry, um, Paul, I'll let you wrap this up here and um, and close this in prayer. I'll give us any closing thoughts you might have and, and close in prayer. Okay, yeah. Well, there's there's a lot more that could be said on this. Um, there's more points that could be, could be made, and there's a lot more scripture to look at. Um, uh, obviously, all that can't fit into an hour, so... I had to, uh, you know, really be selective in what I, uh, what I would uh, share. But um, yeah, this it's it's something that it, 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 like you said, it really goes down to the root uh, of what you believe. Um, and, and if it starts mm-hmm. with the kingdom of Jesus, then uh, and it builds up from there, it makes all the difference. If it starts with how can I go to heaven, or how can I uh, stand uh, a filthy sinner like me stand before a holy God, uh, and it starts with me. You know, then it then it's uh, we get different. We go in different directions. But if it starts with Jesus and his kingdom, uh, then uh, then it's and, and it's built upon that. Then then we're in the, the, the right foundation. So. Amen. Amen. Yeah. So, OK, well, let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, we come to you this morning and we just thank you for, so much for your word that uh, that. Uh, we can read and we can understand and uh, we can be changed by it. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for his kingdom. And thank you that uh, we can uh, have the privilege of, uh, of entering in and pe- being part of your covenant people, of your, uh, uh, of your chosen people, that we can uh, truly live in your kingdom and, uh, and make a difference in this world, live out the way of Jesus and show a world what, uh, uh, what heaven looks like and should look like uh, on this on this earth. So, Lord, we pray for your kingdom to come on earth as it is in heaven. And we want to be faithful um, workers in your kingdom. Help us to be faithful. Help us to keep our eyes uh, focused and in the right place. Help us to not get distracted by those who w- wish to explain away your commandments and your word. And uh, uh, so, Lord, I, I pray for each one here on this call and each one that, uh, that listens to this message. I pray that you would use these words to, uh, to maybe change people's perspective and help them to reorient themselves around you and your kingdom. Uh, be with us today. Be with us the, uh, the rest of the, uh, uh, the week and just uh, pray your blessing on each one here. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Paul. God bless you for your labor here uh, in this in the, on this important subject. Okay, so for next week, uh, I'm sorry, two weeks from now, Lord willing, we'll, we'll be back together here. And the, the topic um, is how to answer Catholic and Orthodox claims, part one, by Lynn Martin. Um, so Lynn Martin is from Shame River Christian Fellowship, a young, young man who has done a lot of study in this. And... Um, and has a has a has a website called anabaptistfaith.org, I believe, where he's putting a lot of his writings up. Some really, really solid writings, um, teaching on on how yeah how how we can answer Catholic and Orthodox claims. So uh, I look forward to having meeting having you all back here then. And uh, God bless you all, and have a have a wonderful day. Grace and peace. As iron sharpens iron, so a man sharpens the countenance of his friend.